Okay, great. Um, so I'm going to talk today. Oops. Uh, oh, hopefully I'm unmuted now. Um, <laughs> I'm going to talk today about the. Um, oh, can you hear me? All right. Great. Okay. Um, about the lost meteorites of Antarctica project. So this is the first UK-led meteorite recovery expeditions and projects to Antarctica. We're funded by the Leverhulme Trust, who are a charitable organisation that fund interdisciplinary science. And we are um, a, a, a mixture of different research disciplines. So we have mathematicians on the project, we have um, electronic engineers and uh, engineers special, specialising in polar um, fieldwork activities and we have meteorite assists as well. So this is a, a project that brought together lots of different ideas to uh, test a hypothesis in Antarctica. So to give you a little bit of a breakdown of what the project is, we were the first UK-led project to go to Antarctica to recover meteorites. We had two test run field trips to Svalbard, which is in the Arctic rather than the Antarctic, to test out some of the equipment we'd use in our proper field campaign. And we had two visits to Antarctica in 2018 and 19, and then 2019 and 2020. So we got back in February um, earlier on this year. And our goal of the project was not only to recover all the meteorites that we find on the surface of the ice in Antarctica, but also to search and recover for subsurface meteorites. So these are meteorites that are encapsulated still within the ice at relatively shallow depths down to about um, 50 centimetres or 60 centimetres into the ice. And I'll explain why that's important in just a few minutes time. Um, we have a website for people that like to go and explore a bit more and we're also on Twitter um, so you can follow um, the activities. So although the field campaigns have now come to their conclusion, um, we're slowly publishing our findings and results and our research findings. Um, and as soon as the meteorites have gone through classification, we will release details of them through our web pages. So I'm going to step back a moment before talking about the field work to, to just to introduce um, you to the topic of what a meteorite is. So you guys are UK PF um, people. I'm sure you've been to seminars before about uh, meteorites and meteoritical research. But just as a reminder, a meteorite is a rock fragment that we find on Earth or indeed on other bodies that's come from another planetary body. So it originated from a body that was struck by a different impactor. It released um, a, a small or indeed a larger amount of material um, from that body, donor body, and then that was transported through space and happened to be on an orbit which interacted with the Earth. That body was gravitationally attractive came down through Earth's atmosphere um, as a fireball, survived entry through the atmosphere, and then can be recovered as a rock sample from Earth. So we get meteorites um, on Earth that originate from different planetary bodies. Some um, come from the Moon, some come from Mars, and many come from the asteroid belt, so near-Earth objects um, that originated from different orbits within the asteroid belt. And we can relate the meteorites, or so the rock samples we have, to their parent bodies through a variety of techniques, be it chemical similarities to rocks collected by the astronauts that walked on the Moon, or chemical affinities to the Martian atmosphere, or spectral affinities to specific asteroid or parent bodies. Um, there's still some unknowns as exactly which meteorite could have come from which particular parent asteroid, but these are active areas of scientific investigation at the moment. So to touch on the different types of meteorites we have, and this is important when we're thinking about what the objectives of our particular Antarctic project are, as, uh, meteorites and their parent bodies can be broken down into different categories. So we have the primitive types of asteroids that come from the first dust that formed early on in our solar system's history. And we refer to these kind of unmod unmodified types and slightly metamorphosed types as the chondritic meteorites. And these are typically stony types of meteorites predominantly made up of silicate minerals with a small amount of metal components associated with them. When we get to the larger scale and bodies were large enough to differentiate into a core, a mantle and a crust, this is where we have slightly more complex types of um, uh, rocks that have originated from these types of parent bodies. So we have some stony types that come from the crust or the outside part of these larger um, parent bodies. And then from the internal structures of them, we have um, some meteorites that are very metal rich or very sulfide rich. And these can be broken down into the um, irons and stony iron types of varieties. And these include iron meteorites and stony iron meteorites, such as the palisite group, the mesosiderite group. So it's sort of a simple classification system and there's many, many subclasses of meteorites. It gets very complicated. But the take home point from this is that we get predominantly stony types 
um, ones that are made up of the silicate minerals, and we get much more iron mineral dominated types of meteorites. How do we use all of this information? Well, although the rocks end up being delivered to the earth, we can investigate them using lots of different types of analytical techniques. We can do petrological investigations, chronological investigations, isotopic geochemical investigations, uh, understanding the magnetic signatures preserved in these meteorites to answer all sorts of questions about the origin and evolution of our solar system how the rocky uh, planets formed and evolved through time, and comparative planetary perspectives, so understanding how the Earth has formed as an object, how the Earth gained its uh, uh, volatile elements and has changed through time by deliveries of larger impactors coming in and colliding with um, planetary bodies all the way through time. So this is the science of cosmic chemistry um, and um, meteorite science, and it cross cuts all these different bodies, whether um, you're looking at a meteorite that's come from an asteroid belt, it can tell you all sorts about comparative planetary scale processes. So to step back to think about the meteorite collection um, as we have it, um, as of March 2020 this year, we have about um, 60,000 odd meteorites that have been found and gone through a formal classification process. So to be given a meteorite name, you have to have submitted certain information, certain data to the Meteoritical Society to be awarded that name and to be recognized as a formal classification for the stone that's found um, at the end of this process. So in terms of the statistics, we have about 40,000 meteorites that have been found in Antarctica. So the constant at the bottom of the uh, map shown here. We've got about 22, or thousand meteorites that have been recovered from elsewhere in the earth and this could include the UK we have a few meteorites in um, Britain and Ireland that have been classified but most of these rest of the world meteorites have been found in hot desert environments such as um, Northwest Africa, Oman, the Atacama Desert, there are some that have been found in Australia. So the rest of the world finds um, these represent meteorites that people have gone out either on a particular meteorite recovery mission or just happen to find and then um, uh, realize the fact they found an unusual stone. When we talk about false um, meteorites, these are meteorites um, that we've seen arrive on Earth as a fireball event. So we've witnessed a fireball where that meteorite has been delivered to Earth and then people have gone out to recover the stone at the end of that process. So we refer to those types of samples as falls rather than finds. And to date we have about uh, 1,200 full stones that are found from all over the earth, um, uh, found on most of the other continents as well. So thinking about the statistics, um, it's important to recognise the fact that Antarctic finds are a really large repository of the meteorites that we have in existing collections. So this is where the maths comes in and this is where our project actually started was um, my colleague Jeff Everett who's a mathematician in the School of Earth Sciences um, it, uh, does research looking at how um, uh, material is moved through glacial systems to understand glaciers here on Earth. And he um, recognised that there was a long-standing um, uh, problem um, in that the statistics of meteorite collections from different places on Earth don't exactly stack up. This has been pointed out before by several other co-authors, uh, several other authors as indicated here. But this is a, a, essentially comes down to a statistics problem. So when we think about kind of the different classes of meteorites we have, uh, if we look at the rest of the world, so um, everything other than Antarctica, about five to six percent of the rest of the world populations, both fines and falls, represent iron and stony iron types of meteorites. So these are things that come from the center of those early planetary bodies, the iron meteorites, the palisites, the mesosiderites. However, in Antarctica, that percentage of iron to non-iron types is a lot less. It's less than a percentage, um, 0.06% is the current statistic for this discrepancy. So this begs the question, why is there a difference between Antarctic meteorite statistics in terms of the stony types versus the iron types and the rest of the world. So this is sort of the mathematical question that kick-started this project. So there's different um, suggestions that have been put forward to account for this anomaly in the past. Could it be that different types of meteorites are being delivered to different places on Earth and that Antarctica just for some reason has less iron meteorites than the rest of the world? 
Could it be the collection biases in terms of how we go out, recover meteorites, and then go through this formal classification system to get them given a name, which means that they're in the database that we can use to look at the statistics. So some types of meteorites have a higher financial value than others. Some are easier to find, um, in particular the iron richer ones are easier to find with metal detectors than non-iron types. So we could be looking at classification issues. Could there be fundamental differences thinking about uh, the period of time that meteorites have been accumulating in different parts of the Earth, so falls, which is just in the last couple of um, thousand years, compared to looking back further in time to meteorite uh, collection zones that could be um, preserving meteorites being delivered there for thousands to tens to thousands to a couple of millions of years. So these are sort of ideas that have been um, discussed in the literature and we've looked into. There is also the suggestion that actually in terms of thinking about Antarctica as being particularly weird, it could be to do with the fact that iron meteorites um, never actually make it to the surface of the ice because they're just always so heavy they sink into the ice. Um, and then there's the hypothesis that we started investigating a little bit more closely, where we were again going back to this idea about how objects are being transported through ice, we were um, starting to consider the fundamental characteristics of meteorites and how they're made up and in terms of how those different materials could interact with the ice that they're actually sitting in. So this led us to the iron, uh, the lost iron meteorite hypothesis, which um, we published in a, a research paper in 2015 in um, Nature Communications, um, sorry, 2016 um, in Nature Communications, where we looked into um, developing a simple mathematical model um, whereby we looked at the thermal conductivity and also the albedo of uh, stony meteorite types versus iron meteorite types and how they would interact with um, an icy material when um, illuminated and not illuminated under the types of sunlight that we'd expect to see um, in Antarctica for however long in the year uh, this particular part of Antarctica actually saw the sun. So the simple models that were developed from this are shown in the bottom left hand corner, um, which is shown in terms of time over a number of years and depth under the ice where the meteorites were interacting with. And we were only considering the phase of meteorite transport and delivery where the meteorites come up in the ice towards the surface and then have a surface near residence time. So what we showed from this analysis was that because the iron meteorites have greater thermal conductivity, they heat up more when exposed to sunlight. It's a very simple hypothesis, a simple thought. But because they are more thermally conductive, they can generate a small pocket of water around them, which facilitates um, them to kind of be transported against the upward flow of ice. And so as the ice moves up, the iron meteorites are continually kind of moving down and then they reach a static horizon, which is indicated in the model here. So we considered um, kind of the average size and shape of meteorites in Antarctica. And then we did some laboratory experiments where our master's project student uh, went into a lab, actually encapsulated different types of meteorites within a very pure ice blocks, so ice blocks that had no bubbles in, and then shone a solar illumination replication lamp on top of them. And actually we were able to video um, these different processes of uh, iron and stony types of meteorites sinking in the laboratory. And the la laboratory measurements matched uh, what the, the theoretical um, kind of simple maths models. So the model prediction we had from this was considering an, an area of debris free ice, we predicted that iron richer meteorites, so the irons and stony time stony iron types of meteorites could potentially be buried at a depth of about 30 centimeters within um, a blue ice area. We've developed this model a little bit more um, and I refer you to my co colleague Andrew Smedley's paper that came out this year where actually it suggests with a bit of a refinement and development of these models maybe the iron meteorites could actually be at a slightly lower limit of about 10 centimeters depth. But we use this to predict, um, to make a prediction for certain areas of Antarctica where we thought, okay, if we, if we could use this as the, uh, the rationale to explain why we're missing iron meteorites, how much of an area of Antarctica would we have to search effectively to try and find the missing iron meteorites, given an average um, ice fields expected statistical population? And the model prediction came out at um, uh, about uh, one iron meteorite per square kilometers of debris free ice. So this was the hypothesis. Um, we proposed this in 2015. Um, we then uh, approached the Lieberkuhn Trust to, to see if they could fund us to actually put this in practice so we could go to Antarctica, 
test this hypothesis and prove or disprove it one way or the other. So touching on um, the kind of more fieldwork side of things, um, meteorites that in Antarctica, I mentioned before, there's about 40,000 meteorites that have been recovered in Antarctica um, over the last, um, oh, well, since 1912 was the first one that was discovered by um, uh, one of Mawson's expeditions to a Delhi land, so down in the, um, I don't know if you can see my pointer, but down at the bottom here in, around, the, uh, around this part of Antarctica over here. It wasn't until the 1970s where there was concerted efforts and a recognition of the fact that there are meteorite stranding zones in Antarctica where you can actually get very rich concentrations of many hundreds of meteorites in some places concentrated against mountain ranges. So the map here denotes all the little green stars that you can see, denotes where meteorites have been recovered from in Antarctica by different meteorite recovery um, teams, scientists that have been going there to, to find meteorite samples. So the Grove Mountain area has been searched very effectively by Chinese colleagues. The Soronde Mountains and the Yamato and Asuka ice fields have been searched um, by the Japanese um, uh, teams and by Belgium teams. And then the Transantarctic mountain ranges where we are places that represent the most amount of searches that have been conducted over the years, predominantly by the very successful um, American program, the ANSMET search program, which I've been fortunate enough to join um, in 2010 and 2011 as well, oh, 2011 and 2012, I can't quite remember the years, but many British scientists have had an opportunity to join this. So colleagues at the Open University, colleagues at the Natural History Museum um, have been uh, writing a letter to join ANSMET. You uh, email the PI of that expedition if you'd like to uh, demonstrate your um, uh, willingness to, to join the research teams each year. But there's um, other teams um, uh, have, have also operated in this arena. Um, we have had British collaboration in the past, so the Euromet um, team um, did operate in the early 2000s, of which again British scientists were able to participate in that meteorite recovery venture. So although we're not the first Brits to go to Antarctica to find meteorites, we, the Lost Meteorite Project is the first UK-led and UK-British Antarctic survey supported project. So when we're thinking about how meteorites end up in the places we actually go and find them, and this is sort of where we were starting our project to think about, okay, we've got the funding to do this, where will we actually go to Antarctica to collect meteorites from? Well, we had to consider first of all as where are the best places to go to. So this is now an ice velocity flow map looking at the same parts of Antarctica as was on the, the first slide, where we see um, the Antarctic Peninsula up here. We have those transantarctic mountain ranges um, uh, going around down the centre of the, the spine of Antarctica. And the black lines that you can see denote the ice catchment area. So this means if you're a meteorite or indeed a piece of snow and you fall within the catchment areas, you're going to be transported from the centre of the polar plateau towards the edge of the continent in whichever way you can kind of see these flow lines moving. And so what happens is meteorites fall all over the centre of Antarctica, they're transported, and then they hit a natural barrier under the ice, typically a mountain range or a buried mountain range, where they're brought up to the surface by the way that the ice flows through the mountain ranges. And I think hopefully, fingers crossed, I have a little video on the next slide, which should show this in action. And so this is uh, that this hypothesis is known as the uh, conveyor belt system. So the meteorite falls, it's transported through a large body of ice, it hits this mountain range and then pops up towards the surface um, where they're available to be recovered by um, uh, effective meteorite teams. So our first job was to demonstrate that there are regions of Antarctica we can get to um, working in collaboration with the British Antarctic Survey and that they were actually meteorite bearing before we wanted to fly any equipment there to try and find our missing iron meteorites. So the first part I'm going to talk about is the first expeditions we did to demonstrate the fact that there are meteorite bearing areas of Antarctica. So the first part of our project was thinking about how and where we could do this. Um, so this is a, a diagram made by my colleague Andrew Smedley, which um, came out in a research paper we just had out in geology, looking to see and understand meteorite recovery zones, thinking about the ice dynamics, so the delivery mechanisms, how meteorites actually are transported through ice, ending up in the places we go and collect them, and thinking about the best environments in terms of altitude, um, wind speed is very important because it's actually the active winds that are removing the surface layers of ice and actually exposing meteorites um, that are being transported within the ice. And thinking about kind of the local climatic conditions and solar illumination conditions for all different places. Um, so this is sort of our starting point. We also had to follow some um, rules and regulations. So we had to uh, ensure that we had 
um, export permits to extract new threats from Antarctica. You have very strict rules about what you can and can't, can't take in and out of Antarctica. We didn't want to go to places in Antarctica where other meteorite uh, teams were operating um, to preserve the, you know, to just kind of discover new areas and do discovery science in new areas that hadn't been searched before. And we also could only go to places that were serviceable where bass could get us to. Um, so um, this shows a, a diagram now of where the British Antarctic Survey mostly operate in Antarctica and mostly do um, their field activities. So the main uh, research station um, that Bass operate is Rothera, which is on the Antarctic Peninsula. Um, and they have a second main base, which has Halley, which is on the eastern side of the Weddell Sea. So hopefully you can see the two bases indicated here and here. And then there's smaller outfield bases, um, such as Fossil Bluff, and there is a runway um, at Sky Blue where the, the aeroplanes can access. And then there's a lot of field camp activities, but predominantly bass operate in this section, the British Ant Antarctic Territory region in Antarctica. So to get out to where we'd identified our best field sites, we flew from the UK to Chile. Um, we flew um, uh, down to Punta Arenas at the southern tip of Chile. And then uh, we flew on uh, Bass's Dash 7 larger aircraft um, all the way over to Rothera Research Station. And then we transferred out via uh, the staging posts and then out to Halley, which was the main research station that we were operating out of on the first build season. Now, my flying by map isn't exactly, uh, so we're going into too much depth about the sheer complexity and the logistics of getting people out to the field. It involves a huge amount of human efforts um, in terms of planning, um, pilot skills to fly the smaller twin otter aircraft, uh, the logistics field support managers to get us in the right place at the right time, and a lot of training from BAS staff um, on base so that we could operate securely in the field. So although the travelling by map shows you just in a few uh, arrows where we got to, it was about uh, three weeks to a month actually after we arrive in Antarctica before we get to our field site, which is indicated here, which is close to the Shackleton mountain range. So we were a very deep field expedition, one of the furthest bass can actually deploy out to. So in terms of the first field trip, um, uh, I was uh, the meteorite team um, member flying out to the field at this point in time. Um, uh, again, it taken a lot of people's efforts to get there. So uh, support from the people back in Manchester to buy the correct field equipment and support from uh, Jeff in terms of helping plan out a lot of these activities. And my colleague Jeff, at the same time I was going out to the field, was actually doing some testing of the field equipment, which I'll come back to and talk in the second part of the talk. So this was the, the kind of first reconnaissance team. Um, so this is me on the right hand side. Uh, this is Julie on the left. She was my amazing field guide. And then we had uh, Vicky who did a lot of the, the flying us around on our twin otter the first field season and Jen, our field engineer. So this was pretty cool. We had a, an all female team getting us out to the field. And we deployed uh, out from Rothera to Halley, which is this incredible research station, looks like a science fiction space place, um, uh, uh, where we touched down, did a little bit more training, um, gathered the supplies we need to transport us out to the field. And then when we get to the field um, in this remote environment, uh, we have to transport off our skidoos, which is our main transport mechanism in the field, uh, along with a lot of fuel, um, food to keep us um, in, in surviving for uh, a month's field work. And then we set up our camp, um, which is frankly in the middle of nowhere, on the edge of a blue ice field. And so we have a tent. This is a Scott tent where we live for the time we're in the um, Antarctic. We have our food supplies and we have our very necessary bathroom tents to keep us protected from the strong winds that blow. So this is a particularly nice sunny blue sky day, a little bit of wind, you can see the black flags moving around, but, but, but a very pleasant working environment. So prior to this point, we've got all the way to the field. I'm very nervous. We don't know if there's going to be any meteorites there, but then, yay, we go out searching and within a couple of days of our first searching, we find our first meteorite. It's pretty small, it's pretty pathetic looking, but nevertheless, it is a beautiful, wonderful space stone. And you can see here on the kind of blue ice, white uh, plateau area, that it's really easy to spot dark colored objects. And the way we do this um, when we're looking for surface meteorites is we drive around, we turn our head side to side on our skidoos, we're not driving very fast, and every rock we come across pretty typically happens to be a meteorite. It gets a bit more complex in places where we get near mountain ranges and there's this terrestrial rock, but normally objects like this one here or this one here is clearly a very nice dark rock sitting on the ice that we can see beautifully and then we bag them, we collect them, we, we note their GPS um, locations, we follow a very strict collection protocol. 
So I'm going to give you now an example of a bit more of a windy day. Uh, hopefully the video's got a bit of sound on it. This is a, a pretty typical of how it's like to collect meteorites in Antarctica. You have snow blowing in your face. Um, you're wearing an awful lot of protective equipment to keep you warm, keep you safe. And then you have to collect the meteorites in this environment as well. So this was a, quite a windy day where the catabatics were really getting up. But hopefully you can see black rocks and white ice is not too difficult. Uh, this is another example. This is uh, the largest meteorite we found in our first expedition. You can hear me being particularly delighted and sort of uh, waving my arms around in the air with this one. Uh, this was a really, really nice find. So you can see here, Julie's got it all nicely backed up. We keep it all very safe and then we transport them back to the UK. But occasionally we do find some unusual stones. So this is where we found a meteorite in the middle. This is the, the meteorite sample here, actually sitting on top of a small mountain in Nunatak that we visited. So this was an unusual example of where we found meteorites in places we weren't necessarily expecting to find them. And this was a particularly exciting find. So at the end of the field season, after four weeks in two different locations um, across this part of Antarctica, Vicky came back to collect Julie and I um, and uh, we went back to Halley for a well-deserved shower and a meal and I can't tell you how good that is after four weeks of not washing. So the outcome of this first reconnaissance trip is we found 36 meteorite samples proving the fact that these were meteorite stranding zones. So we didn't do a lot of systematic searching. Our search styles were very much reconnaissance, but we came back with a lot of data and information about these samples. And these are uh, samples are now back in the UK. And uh, we have Jane MacArthur and Tom Harvey working with a group of us in Manchester at the moment who are working really hard in our uh, clean rooms to classify these samples so that then we know exactly what types we've got. So we've, we've just sort of, uh, the meteorites actually came back last year and we've made really good progress on some of these things. And I just wanted to draw your attention to some of the amazing work um, Tom's doing where he's been taking photogrammetry of the samples we've collected to preserve what they look like before we start cutting them up. So we hopefully have this wonderful collection of imagery that people can use um, later on and use them for public outreach and engagement around the collection as well. So I just want to thank Tom and Jane in particular for all their amazing amazing hard work since last year in terms of helping out with this activity. And then uh, we've been, um, we shipped the meteorites back to the UK cold and so Jane's been doing a grand job defrosting things, getting them all nicely uh, protected, rebagged up again. And we've just started the process of slicing and dicing these things to do the classification when the labs have been shut down. So um, we can't wait to get back in and start this activity proper. But um, in terms of what we've actually found on the first field season, uh, this is some very initial data that we published um, in an LPSC abstract um, last year. We've not done the formal classification yet, so I just want to tell people this is very early stages. This is some data from a, a, an instrument that I took into the field, and so we do have to check all of this. But I want you to take away from this plot, this is a, a, a plot of conductivity versus magnetic susceptibility. And all the data you can see in the background is meteorites that have been analysed before. And the black symbols are the analyzed analyses that I took when I was actually in the field in Antarctica. But the take home point from this is we seem to have quite a wide range of samples collected from the first field season, which is great. It means we've not collected the same thing over and over again. We seem to actually have some iron and stony iron types. We seem to have a range of things that could be chondritic, so things that are uh, representing primitive material. And we may even have some achondritic material, which could mean material that's come from the moon or Mars or a large asteroid parent body like Vesta. So where we're at at the moment is this is preliminary. And we're about to formalize this over the next couple of months. But this is exciting because the, the, the taken point of the first mission was we found meteorites, we knew we had some, and then we needed to go back and test the hypothesis. So the second part of the talk is um, the lost meteorites part. So this is what we did this field season, which was actually going back to Antarctica to test these hypotheses. So we, we did a lot of planning and thinking about, okay, we found meteorites, where should we go back to to deploy search equipment to find subsurface buried types and we decided this is the outer recovery um, glacier part of Antarctica near the Shackleton mountains so this is where we visited on the first field season and of the four blue ice fields in this area we picked the one to go to to deploy equipment to find subsurface meteorites and this was on the basis of Julie and I had found the most amount of samples there so it had the highest density of meteorites per ice area available and using what Julie and I had found, brought back um, a, recovered as meteorite samples and analysing the area that we've covered with our skidoos. My colleague Andrew um, did some modelling work to make a prediction that if we covered every square inch of this ice 
uh, field, how many meteorites would we actually find? And then we could convert that to an expected ratio of iron types to stony types and make a prediction of how many iron meteorites should be buried at depths in this area. And this is the number we came out with. We said, okay, if we search this whole area, we should find about 130 meteorites um, on the surface. And assuming this ratio of stony to iron types, this could would equate to the fact that in total there are five iron meteorites buried somewhere beneath this ice um, uh, area of uh, this, this particular ice field, which equated to 0 0.5 buried iron meteorites per one square kilometer of ice. So we knew we'd have to cover searching this area. Um, up to uh, 10 square kilometers effectively to test the hypothesis. So that's where we started off with and we were like, right, this is what we're going to do. Great. So how are we actually going to try and prove this? Well, the other part of the project is we'd spent two years planning for this by developing equipment to actually go and test if there was metallic material buried within the ice. And we worked with colleagues in the electrical electronic engineering department in Manchester who are really good at finding metal buried within uh, the ground. They have expertise across a, a wide range of disciplines looking at metal in foodstuffs, looking to try and identify contaminated food products. They work with landmine detection projects as well. So they were able to provide us with expertise about finding metal and we work with experts at the British Antarctic Survey engineering team who are really good at putting together equipment to survive in the minus 20 C, minus 10 degrees C uh, cold conditions that we're expecting in Antarctica. So this was put together and we designed a, a very simple metal detection rig. We considered all sorts of things. We considered flying drones around, we considered doing spectroscopy, um, getting magnetometers out, but we actually came down to kind of simplicity and cost effectiveness. And so what we designed was a five system metal detector panel array that could be dragged and powered uh, along behind a skidoo. So in the bottom right hand corner, you can see Jeff in Antarctica on the first field season testing out this equipment um, uh, for our pulse um, metal detectors. So the way this work is we drive along in the skidoo, drag in the detectors, uh, they send out a, um, a pulse into the ice underneath and receive that pulse back. And then we monitor the difference to understand the size and depth of metallic objects buried with ice. And we did a lot of tuning of this in the lab in the UK. And we took this equipment to Svalbard. You can see here, this is the guys testing this, um, dragging um, uh, uh, these metal detectors up and down and, and a glacier in Svalbard to look at temperature issues. Um, and then we did some testing actually in Whaley Bridge, so not far in here in the Peak District, where we drove the system around in a field and this truly is field trials to test things like robustness, to test things like how the detectors were interacting with each other, uh, electronic noise testing and developing the software algorithm, algorithms we need for real time monitoring of the system as well. So although we could collect and store the data for post analysis, when we were driving around on the scooters, we had small panels in front of us that would flash at us. And we also wore earpieces that if we drove over something metallic, we would get a beep in our ear telling us to stop get off the skidoo and then we had handheld metal detectors to actually search the ice as well. So all this hard work and I do want to re-emphasize just how many people put time and energy into doing this and developing this technology. We shipped everything together in um, August 2019 and we put it on the boat and it was sent down to Antarctica. And then when our team arrived in Antarctica at the end of November 2019, we first of all reconstructed this at Rotheray. So uh, on the left hand side here, this is Roma Tartes, who's a meteorite scientist in um, Manchester. This is Jeff Ebert, who's the mathematician and the PI of the project. This is me uh, putting together some of this equipment in one of the cargo yards at Rotheray, just to check everything survived correctly, everything was working well and working out how to put it all together in a cold environment. So you see here, um, uh, there's lots of cups of tea and a lot of um, uh, swearing as we put this thing together. And then I want to point out the real hero of our project. Um, this is Walter van Ver, who is a PhD student. He's an electronic engineer in Manchester, who without him, we probably wouldn't have even left Rotheray. He did an amazing job checking that the electronic hardware systems were still working as we'd shipped them from Manchester troubleshooting and just all around being an amazing guy so this shows the beauty of engineers and scientists having to work together and to try and understand each other and uh Valter was just incredible he, he he got us in good shape to get out to the field and then again when we got to the field unless we'd taken Valter we just wouldn't have got anywhere so um uh yeah I call him the hero of the project he genuinely is 
So after quite a considerable amount of faffing, which I'm not going to go into, uh, and by faffing I mean um, poor Jeff and Bouter and our field guide Rob getting stuck in the field for 10 days without a lot of equipment, uh, Roma and our other field guide Taft spending a, a couple of weeks at a different field site and me enjoying an awful lot of tea sitting around at Halley, um, we all managed to finally end up being in the field together on December the 20th. So this is Roma on the left, then we've got uh, our fantastic pilot who got us out to the field. Uh, this is Mark, then there's myself, Rob, who was our first field guide. We've got Valter, Jeff and Taff, who was our main field guide for the project. So December 20, we were ready to go, we were ready to rock. And we set up the equipment, we got it all sorted at our field site, checked again that it was all together. And then the first few days we did an awful lot of testing. So we set up a test track to get the system tuned to the blue ice field that we were going to be working in. So this is Valter dragging our detector and equipment um, on the skidoo. You can see here driving through a flag and uh, we've got buried some holes where we've buried um, iron metal objects at different depths to test the sensitivity of the system and to make sure it's all working. So uh, is gonna drive the skidoo and the test panels over this test track. And then I think you're gonna see Jeff, Roma, and then Taff one by one, hopefully, giving him the thumbs up that he drove over the correct hole correctly. There we go, and a thumbs up from Taff and Roma, and there's Bouter driving over the hole with our test dummy meteorite then. So we did a lot of testing and Bouter processed a lot of the data on the fly to check that everything was working correctly. We also started surface searching and here's the picture of some of us with some of the early meteorite finds that we recovered. Um, you can see here all covered up with our nice protective equipment. We wear big face goggles to make sure we don't go snow blind and you can see it's pretty cold everybody's got their hats up on this particular day. And then uh, here's Roma with our poster boy shot of the project with a really lovely enormous meteorite that we recovered. And just check out these ice crystals. This was just an incredible day. There was this like hoar frost everywhere and then these beautiful meteorites poking their heads up through the ice surface. And a couple of other stunners for people that love meteorites. This is one of my favorites, a flight shaped sample with a rollover lip. So this is where you can see the actual orientation that this meteorites come down through the atmosphere. And another example, this looks like a particularly nice brecciated type. Um, this is one that I can't wait to analyze to find out what we find, um, if it's a particularly exciting uh, achondritic type or a brecciated chondrite. It's, there's lots of potential for what this could be. But whilst all the surface searching was sort of going on, uh, our main aim, don't forget, was to find the subsurface meteorites. So we spent quite a lot of time driving the panel detection equipment around. Um, you can see here, this is a particularly snowy day, which is not great for finding surface meteorites. So I was quite irritated, but was great for dragging the panels because we couldn't see exactly where we were driving. So this is snow plowing and then dragging the panels behind. And I think that's Roma driving the panel system around and that's marked here. But you can see here just how much the system is jiggling up and down and is vibrating around behind the uh, Skidoo uh, array. So um, this is what happened next. So we spent a good couple of weeks kind of driving the equipment around and then little bit by little bit we drove this thing to destruction so um, we suffered all sorts of infield equipment damage including uh, breaking of switch systems, damage to the electronic boxes themselves, things falling apart. And so we were continually doing a repair job as we were going along. And Bowser here was sort of continually kind of rewiring systems. We had a tent set up for him to work in. Um, and we kind of got things going. So Bowser described this process as death by a thousand cuts. So when we go to Antarctica, we put a huge amount of effort in and we're, we're working really hard, you know, long days, cold conditions. This is pretty demoralizing as the equipment you've taken to the field sort of starts to pile up into a pile of stuff that isn't working anymore. And you can see, I think the look on Roma's face in this next shot sums it all up very nicely um, in terms of how dejected we were slowly starting to get with this whole process. And after a good couple of weeks, um, we were posting on the blog in real time. And so the BBC picked up this story. And uh, when we declared the project over in terms of deployment of the metal detection array panels, um, they, they, uh, John Thamos posted this, this nice kind of summary of what was going on. Um, and then this was followed up actually after we got back with Robin Andrews in the New York Times also published the challenges of uh, effective field, uh, deployment of things in Antarctica. So if you'd like to go more, these links are on our website to go and find out what happened. But um, I should also point out, you know, it, although we were working hard, um, uh, you know, every, everything was uh, uh, 
kind of going a little bit to pop towards the end of the field season and then poor Roma had to have some infield dentistry as well so to add insult to injury uh, Roma had to have a, an infield filling but Taft's amazing uh, got out his uh, dentistry kit and applied it and we and um, got a filling sorted for Roma so um, by the 9th of January um, the field season was pretty much wrapped up for the, the, the subsurface meteorite discovery part of the project and so Roma, Jeff and Bauta were collected on the 9th of January but we were really successful and by this point in time we'd managed to recover 64 meteorites from the surface of the ice so by all means we've not necessarily achieved everything we wanted to achieve with the subsurface searching but we have come back with a really nice haul of meteorites and then Taff and myself were lucky enough to stay out into the field um, a little bit longer this was like the bonus part at the end of the trip that we weren't anticipating and we managed to completely search all of the ice fields in the surrounding area and recover uh, a, a large amount more of samples as well so this was sort of a, a, a great bonus at the end of the trip in that we could really finish this area off collect all the meteorites that we could possibly find um, to bring them back to be uh, to be classified here so in terms of the season uh, this is my last slide before I'll just put the conclusions up um, the top two uh, diagrams here show the area that we visited on both field seasons uh, the red tracks show you where we went on the skidoos and where we've completed doing all the surface searching and on the left hand side the yellow tracks show where we went with the metal detection panels to do the subsurface searching um, uh, some of this includes time when we had issues with the equipment but this is also includes where everything was working really well so for this particular ice field where we did the subsurface searching we actually found 69 meteorites which is really good we've got lots of surface samples from this area of the ice field but because of the equipment failure we were only able to effectively search about 0.74 square kilometers of the ice field using the metal detection panels which unfortunately this was not enough to test our statistics of how much of the area was going to have iron meteorites underneath it so ultimately we were not able to prove or disprove the hypothesis on the field season where we've deployed this equipment but where we're at now is we have the meteorites um, that are coming back to the UK and the next step is to go through classify them and then we want to understand and address questions about differences between the different ice fields we visited in terms of the types of meteorites and the concentrations of meteorites that we've discovered so where we're at at the moment is the classification of the first season samples is happening um, but it's been disrupted somewhat. The second lot of meteorites are now uh, arrived back in the UK and once the classification has been done we're going to the samples will be transferred for long-term curation hopefully down to the Natural History Museum. We're currently in progress of sorting the paperwork out and then from there they'll be made available to everybody in the community to request as per the NHM's normal request rules um, for loans and um, so they'll be available for everybody to do research on and then once we've done the classification the lost meteorites teams a real interest in this is thinking more about the statistics and to understand if the data we used in the original hypothesis was actually valid for the outer recovery region and we've got some ideas that we're starting to explore but I think I've talked enough and I'm going to leave it there and I'm happy if we've got time John to take a few questions I'm not sure if I talk too much or not but um, thank you again for inviting me and if I don't answer your question today and you want to get in touch with us, um, ping me an email and I can put you in contact with Jeff and Andy and Jane and uh, Tom and everybody else involved with the project, the engineers, if you'd like to talk to them more. So thank you.